Uh, I'm Glenn Solomon. I am the chair of internal medicine and neurology at Wright State University. And I am uh, a general internist by training. And this is not doing what I want it to do. Um, and I am also board certified in headache medicine. And what I'd like to do in the next, oh, 20 to 25 minutes is give you a very brief overview of common headache disorders. And then I'd like to open up for the last half or so of our time to answer questions and, and discuss cases. And I have a couple of cases and I'll start with a couple of cases. Uh, but I am more interested in, in really hearing your cases as we go forward. So let's see if we get this to work. So my disclosures are no pharmaceutical grants or honorary or advisory boards. And I do this to support my dog, B.B. King Solomon. I want to present two cases that I saw in my practice one week ago yesterday. So these are real patients that I just that happened to come in the same day and I wanna present them. Then we'll go through some didactic and we'll come back at the end and talk about these cases. So the first case was a 39 year old woman who had a long history of intermittent headaches and but came in because for the last one month, she's had a change in her headaches. They've become very, very severe. She just, they were one-sided headaches in the front they lasted about two hours, and she described it as feeling like, as she used the term, Chucky was sticking an ice pick in her eye. Um, along with that, she said that the eye got red and it would water, and she'd get these attacks one or two times a day, but always at, at least one of them was at night, typically about five o'clock in the morning. The other one could come on in the evening or sometime during the day. Second case that, we, that I saw last Thursday was a 30-year-old woman who had a one-year history of severe headaches, but again, a long history of intermittent headaches. These new severe headaches were bilateral they started in the neck and worked up to the forehead. The pain lasted the better part of the day, at least four hours. She described it as the worst pain she's ever had. She said she oftentimes would just lay in bed and cry because the headache was so severe. It was squeezing, it was pounding, and the worst headaches she's ever had. Along with these headache attacks, She'd have some nausea. She'd be sensitive to light. Basically, she couldn't get out of bed when she'd have one of these attacks. These attacks would occur once or twice a week, typically awakening, awakening the patient from sleep, uh, but she also could get attacks during the day. So we're going to come back at the end and, and sort of dissect out these cases and talk about what we think that they may represent. We're going to focus today in the next few minutes on the primary headache disorders of migraine, tension type headache, and cluster headache. And I will tell you that there are at least 112 different types of headache according to the International Headache Classification. We're going to talk about the three mo more common types of primary headache disorders. We're not going to talk about brain tumors. Um, we're not going to talk about giant cell arteritis, rare you know, less common types of headaches. If you have questions about them, we can certainly talk about that towards the end. So I want to start with migraine. And this is one of my favorite cartoons from Larson, the far side, called The Angel of Migraine. Because I think if you if you grasp this particular slide, you will know most of what you need to know about how to diagnose migraine. First, the patient. Typically a woman, the most common ages for migraine, 20 to 40 are the peak incidence of migraine. You'll notice her hand is on half of her head because migraine is typically a one-sided headache, although a third of the time it can be both sides. 
The boxing gloves represent the pounding pain that's typical of migraine. The only thing that troubles me in this particular cartoon is that the drapes are open because most people with migraines would have those drapes closed because they couldn't stand the light. So let's hit it again. Migraine is intermittent. It is not a constant daily headache. Two thirds of the time it's unilateral, a third of the time it's bilateral. It typically will shift sides. So it's rare that somebody will only have right-sided headaches if they have migraine. Some of them are gonna be on the left. Typically pounding or throbbing, the intensity is moderate to severe and the headache gets worse with exertion. So people with migraines wanna lay down, they don't wanna move, they don't wanna bend. Typical duration is a day, but anywhere from four hours to three days. Sensitivity to light and noise are very common, and there's almost always some gastrointestinal upset, which can range from, I don't feel much like eating, to people who are throwing up. About 15% of people who have migraines will have a warning before their migraine, what we call an aura. And the most typical types of aura are what we call fortification spectrum. They look like the old ancient forts. Uh, this little C pattern is very common that people will have a, a blind spot in the shape of a C that will move across their visual field and grow over time. Migraine represents some focal brain dysfunction. While visual is most common, there are people who get auditory. There are people who get olfactory auras. So you can get different auras. The key to the aura, as far as I'm concerned, is 20 minutes in duration. Auras are almost always 20 minutes long, but people don't look at their watch. So if somebody tells you it's 10 minutes, if somebody tells you it's a half an hour, that fits with 20 minutes. But they are typically some neurologic phenomenon lasting about 20 minutes, they come on gradually, and usually the headache will follow right after the aura goes away, but there can be lag time as long as an hour. The other key thing to an aura is there are usually both positive and negative phenomena. So we talk about something called scintillating scotoma, which is a blind spot with flashing lights surrounding it, probably the most common visual aura. But again, positive and negative, if you get it in your arm, what people will get is tingling and numbness. They can't feel their arm, but then they get the tingling sensation. So again, positive and negative phenomenon, both typically lasting about 20 minutes. Occurs in 15, maybe as much as 20% of patients before their, their migraine. Far more common is what we used to call common migraine, or now we call migraine without aura. There are a bunch of different variants of migraine, and you'll hear these terms, basal or migraine, retinal migraine, ophthalmoplegic migraine. They're all a variety of migraine with aura. They're all some sort of neurologic phenomena that occur before the headaches typically start or sometimes can occur with the headaches, and they can involve the eye, they can involve the posterior uh, brainstem functions. Um, they're not very common, but they're quite striking when they occur. So what do we know about migraine? Why, why do we even spend our time talking about it? If you look worldwide at neurologic disability, migraine is the second most common cause of disability worldwide amongst all neurologic conditions. And that's because this is a common disease. 18% of women and 6% of men will have a migraine in any given year. Migraine frequency peaks between the ages of about 25 and 55. So it hits during peak productive years. And that's why the disability is so significant and clearly can impair people's ability to function at school, work, in any type of environment. I wanna take a minute and talk about migraine triggers. Everybody likes to talk about, oh, migraines caused by stress. 
And I always like to make the point that migraine absolutely is not caused by stress. It's caused when stress goes away. Migraines are much more common on weekends, on holidays, and on vacations. So it's let down that typically is the time when people get their migraines. It's not typically during their most stressful times. Now, to flip that, when people are under greater stress and then they have greater letdown, they may be more prone to migraines. So stress in that regard, when the stress eases up, may be a trigger for migraines. Changes in sleep, either too much sleep or too little sleep can trigger migraines. Skipping meals is a well-known trigger. Hypoglycemia does clearly factor in migraines. Diet is a minimal factor in migraines. In spite of everybody talking about migraine diets, and we always love to talk about don't drink red wine, don't eat chocolate. You know, today's National Chocolate Day, nobody gives up chocolate. People might give up sex. They will give up lots of things. They're not giving up chocolate. So don't even tell your patients to give up chocolate. What I tell my patients is if you find that there is a food that more than half the time you eat it and you get a headache, stop eating it. You don't usually need a doctor to tell you that. Um, diet is rarely a factor. And I do not put my patients on elimination diets to look for a trigger for their migraines. Hormone changes, clearly drop in estrogen levels will trigger migraines. So menses is the most common trigger for migraines in women. And weather changes absolutely trigger migraines. Barometric pressure changes, fronts moving through an area, people will get an increase in their migraines. There are lots of different drugs that we can use to treat migraines. I don't want to spend a lot of time today talking about drug therapy, other than to say we can use anti-epileptic drugs, antidepressant drugs, beta blockers, antihypertensives, botulinum toxin for something called chronic migraine, and our newest class of drugs, the CGRP monoclonal antibodies. The one point that I do want to make, because I know we have a lot of mental health folks working on this conference today, the SSRI drugs are not effective preventive migraine treatments. The SNRIs work, the tricyclics work, and in truth, the MAOIs are still probably the single most effective drugs I've ever seen to treat headache. Um, we used to use a lot of phenylzine back in the 80s uh, for migraine. They are absolutely miserable drugs to prescribe and to monitor patients, but they were incredibly effective drugs for people with intractable headache. The new medications, I just want to mention that there are four new injectable drugs that we use to treat migraine. Um, these drugs are about $700 per month for treatment. The literature does not show them to be any more effective than our existing oral therapies. Uh, I will tell you that in clinical practice, for people who have failed many therapies, these drugs have been a godsend. Um, what's nice about them is they're monoclonal antibodies. They don't interact with other medications. They have minimal side effects except for allergic reactions at injection sites. Um, so they, they are a nice new option for us, but they are not particularly more effective than our existing drugs, and they are much more expensive. I still like to talk about using non-drug preventive therapies. For many of our patients, they don't want to take medications. Migraine is commonly a disease of women in childbearing years who may need an alternative to drug therapy. And so things like acupuncture can work. What's fascinating about acupuncture and migraine is that it doesn't matter what you do, it works. It doesn't matter where you stick the needles, whether you hook them up to electricity, whether you stimulate depth. For some reason, none of it seems to make a difference but the literature does show that acupuncture does seem to work. Biofeedback is something I 
loved when I could use it. Problem with biofeedback is at least in Dayton, there are virtually no providers to, to do biofeedback treatment. Uh, it is very effective. Um, patients do well with it. Uh, we would do home bio, you know, we would tr get them trained, have them do home biofeedback. And it is every bit as good as drug therapy. The biggest problem is getting insurance to pay for it and finding providers who can provide biofeedback treatment. As far as acute therapy of migraines, lots of things work. And whenever you see a list and people say lots of things work, that means none of them work really that great or you'd only need one of them. So we use triptans, and I'll talk about triptans in just a minute, drugs like sumatriptan, rizotriptan. They're probably our first-line drugs for people with moderate or severe migraine. But even things like high-dose acetaminophen, aspirin, non-steroidals in pretty high doses, all are very effective. Dihydro, nas uh, dihydro ergotamine nasal spray works. And the last, the acetaminophen, aspirin, caffeine, that's Excedrin, uh, or it's generic versions, and it also works. We also have two new drugs that you will see advertised on TV, uh, Ubrojapant and Remegipant. Ubrojapant is Ubrel-V, Remegipant is, um, I'm blanking on it, new. Nertek. Nertek. I knew it was an NU something, Nertek. Um, yeah, I think about them as Whoopi Goldberg and uh, Serena Williams, but um, I am told it does not improve your backhand if you choose one versus the other. There are some small differences between the two of them, but I want to make a couple of points. They are very expensive. They're about $90 a tablet, um, which is cheaper than an emergency room visitor missing a day at work, but it's still expensive. The biggest difference is the half-life of these drugs. Ubrojapant is really an acute therapy drug. You can take it. You can take a second dose later in the day if you need it. With Remegipant, this is the one drug that is approved both as a preventive drug, so you can take this every other day to prevent migraines, or as an acute abortive therapy, but it's one pill once a day. Those are the bigger differences. Remegipant at least in studies, is a little bit better tolerated than Ubrojapan. They're both very well tolerated drugs. The advantages of the G pants over the triptans is purely the fact that these drugs don't affect the coronary arteries. They don't cause coronary artery spasm, which has always been the concern about triptans and before that the ergots. So these are drugs that we think are safe in people who have coronary artery disease, the population where you don't want to use triptans. That's really their value. Uh, they also can be used in people who either can't tolerate triptans because of side effects or who have failed several triptans. This is an old slide, but it's a slide that I like because it looks at all of the different triptans in terms of efficacy and in terms of tolerability. And the point to make is that if that sumatriptan was our first triptan, very effective drug, how do the other six triptans that follow it compare? And the point that I want to make is that rizotriptan, probably a little bit more effective than the other triptans, and almotriptan is by far the best tolerated triptan um, with similar efficacy to sumatriptan, naratriptan, also very well tolerated, but takes a long time to kick in and is not nearly as effective. So not a lot to choose in, in choosing your initial triptan, but if somebody either has too slow an onset, if, they're, if you're starting with sumatriptan or they have side effects that are bothersome, you do have alternatives for a little bit faster onset, a little bit better efficacy, or a little bit better tolerability. This is a slide that I just want to talk about for just a second because it talks about two things. People who have pain the pain freedom at two hours means your headache is gone two hours after you take a tablet and sustained pain freedom, which means you take a tablet and your headache stays away for the next 24 hours without you needing any additional medication. The point to make here is that the triptans 
are significantly more effective than our newer GPANT drugs. Lasmiditan is a new is a new drug. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. Um, it's a serotonin one F antagonist, uh, agonist, and it causes some sedation. You can't drive for eight hours after you take it. Uh, it has no great advantages over our other abortive drugs. But I do want to just make the point that people come in, they want the newest drug, they want the drug they're seeing on TV. Those newer drugs are less effective than our older, less expensive generic triptans. So unless you have a real reason to want to give someone one of the G pants, we ought to be sticking with our tried and true drugs. What about opiates? This, these are questions that always come up. Opiates are not terribly effective for migraines. Their efficacy, probably less than 30%. We always have to be concerned about the risk of habituation, and people can't, don't function at a high level after they've taken opiates. On the other hand, if people have coronary artery disease and you can't use a triptan, uh, maybe they don't want to spend $90 for a tablet of one of the G pants or their insurance won't pay for it. Opiates may have a role. If, we're, if patients are having infrequent migraines once a month, twice a month, opiates really don't pose much of a risk for habituation with very infrequent use. And many patients value having opiates as a rescue medicine if their other medicines don't work. Uh, certainly a nicer option than having to go to the emergency department. I wanna shift gears now and talk about chronic tension type headache. And this, there are, when we talk about tension type headaches, 97% of the population has had a tension type headache in the last year. That's that by temporal, frontal pressure headache, whole head hurts, feels like your head's in a vice or the tight hat band around your head, um, usually pretty mild or moderate, no associated symptoms. People don't get sick to their stomach. They're not sensitive to light or noise. About 3% of the population gets this headache every single day, oftentimes constant without ever letting up. They have headache constant from the time they wake up till they go to bed at night. It's not a severe headache. They rarely have to go to bed with it. They manage to function, but they're suffering with pain every day. Uh, and that's about 3% of the population. So let's say, let's face it, if you really love me, you'd have married someone else. There are a number of other features that many of these patients will have. They oftentimes have a lot of mood lability. They oftentimes crave sweets and carbohydrates. They may gain a lot of weight. They're tired all the time, but they also don't sleep well. And they oftentimes will complain that their memory and concentration is not good. So it's not uncommon to see some neurovegetative symptoms along with this, but they, again, it's hard to sort out how much of this is chronic pain, how much of this is related possibly to some form of depression. Disease that typically starts in the teen years, maybe as late as the thirties. The point that I wanna make about the onset of this this is not a type of headache that people start getting in their 60s or 70s. If you see an older patient who's never had headaches in their life and now they're starting to have daily headaches, you want to make sure you look for a secondary cause for their headaches. There are no FDA approved drugs to treat chronic tension type headache. Um, we, typ we typically use things like NSAIDs, the tricyclics and SNRIs, again, I will say that the SSRIs don't typically work for pain. And we will sometimes use muscle relaxants, particularly tizanidine tends to be fairly helpful. Don't talk to me during visiting hours. My wife thinks I'm in a coma. There are non-drug approaches that we use here. Again, biofeedback. Guided imagery is one of the things I really like. When I was at Cleveland Clinic, we did some studies with guided imagery and really did find that it was helpful for patients with chronic tension type headache. Uh, it's something I encourage my patients to, to utilize now. It's cheap. They can do it themselves. It doesn't, you know, it's 15 or 20 minutes a day. 
uh, can be really pretty effective. Relaxation therapy, and to a lesser extent, physical therapy can also help. Physical therapy, particularly if you have older patients with chronic tension type headaches, particularly if they're complaining about it coming from their neck, that's where physical therapy really tends to have a, a bigger role. Combining a tricyclic and relaxation or biofeedback is more effective than either therapy alone. That's some work from Ken Holroyd from um, Ohio University, published in JAMA. Now it's 20 years ago. The worst type headache, that, the headache that we call the headache from hell, sometimes called suicide headache, is cluster headache. Cluster is called cluster because the headaches occur in bunches or clusters. One attack to eight attacks per day, typically for two to four months, followed by maybe a year's long remission. These headaches are unilateral. They are almost always periorbital or centered around the eye. Patient descri patients describe it as a hot poker stabbing them in their eye. I will tell you my favorite description of cluster headache was a patient who said, it feels like a 400 pound woman in a stiletto heel is stepping on my eye. Um, these are the most severe pain known to mankind. This is pain that is worse than natural childbirth. It's worse than kidney stones. This is considered to be the most severe pain known to mankind. And that is in part why these are called suicide headaches. Typical duration is about 45 minutes. With the headache, the eye typically droops, it tears, the nose on one side gets congested, and as the headache goes away, the nose will oftentimes run, the eye will typically get red, and again, it droops, it tears. Um, pretty dramatic, but I will tell you that patients don't stop and look in the mirror to say that their eye droops or gets red. You'll typically get that from a spouse or someone else who has seen them during a headache attack. One of the key features to note about cluster headache is agitation. Whereas with migraine, people lay in bed, they don't want to move, they want the lights down, no sound. People who have cluster headaches can't sit still. If they sit in a chair, they're rocking or bouncing. They're pacing the floors. They're banging their heads against the walls. I've had patients who put on gym shorts and go for a run in the snow to take their mind off the pain. I've seen patients with forehead burns from rubbing their heads on the, on the carpeting. Uh, these are patients who are tremendously agitated. Again, it's, it's a periodic headache, a month to four months in duration, and then remission, uh, typically spring and fall. I will tell you, it is the week that you change the clocks are the most common time to see cluster headaches. So that's coming up in about two weeks will be cluster week. Uh, for some reason, when we change the clocks, that's when folks get their clusters. Clusters occur in the early part of the night, typically 90 minutes to 120 minutes after somebody goes to sleep, typically associated with the first REM cycle. This is a disease typically starts mid twenties or so, can last, I've seen patients in their 90s who continue to have cluster headaches. Uh, typically, we say 20s to 50s, but they don't always go away. Prevalence, where we said 6% of men and 18% of women get migraine, only about one in a thousand men get cluster, and it's three to six times more common in men than in women. That's related to smoking. 90% of cluster sufferers are smokers or serious secondhand smoke uh, exposures. The, the traditional picture of the cluster sufferer was a tall, thin man with a lion-like facies. I always say they looked like the cowardly lion in The Wizard of Oz, and for some reason, hazel eye color. And I would say that in a headache waiting room, if you see a tall guy with a pack of cigarettes in his pocket, probably the cluster sufferer, everybody else in the waiting room is probably a woman with migraine. So you can pick these folks out. This is a very stereotyped headache. Almost everybody with cluster will give you a very similar story. We treat this with steroids, with ergotamine, 
Uh, now we have galcancizumab, one of the new monoclonal antibodies that we can use to treat cluster headaches. Um, for maintenance therapy for cluster, for you know, so we'll start off with an induction therapy of a couple of weeks of steroids, and then we'll usually use verapamil. Uh, we can also use lithium. It is a bit slower in action than verapamil, uh, but it can be very effective for cluster headaches. Uh, and again, galcancizumab, I, I have not found Divalpro-X to be particularly effective. The key thing to remember about acute treatment of cluster, oxygen is the drug of choice, 10 liters a minute on a simple rebreather mask for 10 minutes, and you'll knock out these attacks. Remember, most of these attacks are occurring in the middle of the night, waking somebody up from sleep. They can have an oxygen tank next to their bed. If they wake up with, a with an attack, put a mask on, bend over, look down at their feet. For some reason, that position makes oxygen work better for cluster, and in 10 minutes, they're better. Remember that 90% of these folks smoke. If they smoke in bed, you don't want them keeping their oxygen tank there. The triptans can be effective, but here again, you want to use a fast-acting triptan. The duration of cluster is typically 45 minutes, so injectable sumatriptan will work within about 5 to 10 minutes. That's really your triptan of choice. The oral triptans are just too slow to be of much use. We talk about cluster headache as a headache that wakes people up from sleep. I also want to make the point that there are two other types of headaches that awaken people from sleep. We've talked about migraines. Migraines don't typically wake people up from sleep, but it's not that uncommon for somebody to occasionally have a migraine wake them out of a sound sleep. The third type of headache that awakens people from sleep is one that no one's ever heard of. It's called hypnic headaches, more common in older women. This is a headache that we call the alarm clock headache because it typically occurs the same time of, of night every night. For some reason, it tends to be three or four o'clock in the morning, so it's a little bit later in the day than our cluster headaches, and it's what we call a benign headache. It's a bilateral pressure headache without associated symptoms that's bad enough to wake people up from sleep, but it's not a terribly severe headache, and it's not associated with other symptoms, but it occurs night after night after night. What's interesting about hypnic headache is the treatment of choice is a dose of caffeine at bedtime. People think you're nuts when you prescribe this. Uh, I had a lady in my office yesterday who had hypnic headache. She thought I was the greatest doctor in the world because her last doctor told her she had to give up her Coca-Cola. And I said, no, I want you to drink two Cokes at bedtime before you go to sleep. I made a friend for life. I hope it helps her headaches. Uh, she thought I was the greatest doctor because I prescribed Coca-Cola, didn't have to give her a prescription, gave her something she likes. Uh, she was not a coffee drinker because normally I would tell people have a cup of coffee at night because it has a, a lot more caffeine in it um, and a little bit less liquid that might wake them up at night. But for some reason, caffeine is particularly effective. All right, so I want to now go back to our cases and see what we think here. So our first case was the 39-year-old woman with severe headaches for a month. Long history of headaches that sounded a lot like migraines. These were unilateral. The new headaches were unilateral, frontal. They lasted about two hours. Worst pain she's ever had in her life. Eye would water. The nose would run. Get them once or twice a day. Would awaken her from sleep. In her case, they woke her up at 5 o'clock in the morning. So what do people think? Sounds like cluster headache. Yeah, these are cluster headaches. So cluster is not that uncommon in people who also have underlying migraine. Migraine's a real common disease, doesn't preclude you from getting other types of headaches. This is a woman who got who had cluster had new onset cluster headaches. Um, because of some underlying medical issues, uh, she was not a candidate for verapamil, for lithium. Um, she had Heart, she had congestive heart failure. She had bipolar illness. She was on a good regimen of things, did not want to start her on lithium, did not, was not able to put her on verapamil, put her on galcancizumab, 
and she actually did quite well on that. Second case, the 30-year-old woman, severe headaches for about a year, start back in her neck, worked up to the front, nausea, photophobia, couldn't get out of bed, would lay in bed crying once or twice a week, uh, typically would awaken her from sleep, could occur anytime during the night. What do you think? Migraines? Yeah, this woman had migraines. And her migraines were a little different because for most people, migraines occur during the day. Um, she got a lot of hers at night. She had had a long history of migraines. She had features that you don't typically think of as migraines. Her headache was bilateral. Well, a third of the time it can be bilateral. You know, it would awaken her from sleep. Again, not the typical pattern of migraine, but these are migraines. And we, I just saw her as a new patient, so I don't know how she's done, but this is the kind of patient, this is the patient where I like to prescribe injectable sumatriptan as her acute therapy because she's waking up with a full-blown attack when you have a full-blown migraine attack, you tend to get gastroparesis, the stomach doesn't empty, our oral therapies are just not nearly as effective. And so this is a patient where if we give her an injectable sumatriptan, odds are she'll have relief within about 20 minutes, we'll be able to go back to sleep, we'll wake up headache-free, uh, and she should do very well. Because of the frequency of her headaches, she also is a candidate for prophylactic therapy. Um, if I remember correctly, I started her on a beta blocker, uh, which I like to use as first-line therapy for a lot of my patients. Uh, and again, we'll see how well that works. But certainly somebody with one to two headaches a week that are disabling should be on preventive therapy as well as acute therapy. I want to stop the presentation at this point.